Hi, thank you for, for watching. I'm here to tell you about our latest paper in Science Translational Medicine about precision functional brain mapping for depression associated with traumatic brain injury. Uh, my name is Sean Zaliki. I'm a neuropsychiatrist at Brigham and Women's Hospital at the Center for Brain Mind Medicine, and I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And I'm specifically talking here about depression associated with traumatic brain injury. Uh, and the reason why we're studying this is because we believe that it's, it might be something different from depression alone or traumatic brain injury alone. You've been hearing a lot about traumatic brain injury in the news recently, in the last few years. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because of changes in policy in the military and uh, professional sports leagues, uh, such as the NFL, and elsewhere. And a lot of these changes in policy have been driven by advancements in science. As we've learned in recent years that uh, traumatic brain injury, even when you can't detect any abnormalities immediately, can cause uh, long-term brain changes that are indeed detectable. That has led people to change policies. Uh, however, that's limited to traumatic brain injury, or TBI, alone. It turns out there are probably certain sub-syndromes within TBI, and we were looking to, uh, to better characterize the mood symptoms that occur in these patients as a distinct syndrome that might be different from just TBI alone or depression alone. And so I'd like to start by talking about uh, a story behind the science. All this started with a specific patient that I was taking care of when I was a third year psychiatry resident. A few other psychiatry residents had tried to help her in the past. Um, she had been, she'd had a unique pattern of side effects of the treatment. She'd had a unique pattern of symptoms. There was a lot of difficulty with frustration that was unique to TBI rather than uh, depression alone. Uh, difficulties with reward, but also difficulties understanding punishment. It was a unique range of symptoms. Uh, she didn't respond to most conventional treatments. And so after a while, I decided to reach out to our neurologist for, for help to, to see if we can collaborate on this together. It just so happens that her neurologist was David Brody, one of the world's leading experts on traumatic brain injury. And we had a long conversation about how we can best help her and how we can learn more about this syndrome in general. I told him about how I had observed that patients with, the, with traumatic brain injury seem to have a different pattern of depressive symptoms. They're different from the rest of the patients that we see with major depression. And he told me, you know, this is nothing new. We've known this for a long time. Uh, those of us who treat traumatic brain injury every day, we see that there is a unique pattern of uh, depressive symptoms that's different from depression alone or from traumatic brain injury alone. But that said, nobody's ever been able to prove that this is different physiologically. This is a unique physiological entity. And nobody's ever been able to find a treatment that really works for these people. So we decided to work together to try to solve those two problems. Uh, we decided to try to map their brains to figure out what's different about them and also develop a treatment that's targeted to those brain abnormalities. Today I'm going to tell you about the first half of that, about how we uh, uh, tried to map their brain to find out what's unique about them, but we're also working on the second half, uh, identifying a new treatment for them. So first I want to talk a little bit about the burden of TBI-associated depression. How does it affect society and, uh, and these patients specifically? We know that TBI increases the risk of depression probably about eightfold. Depending on which study you look at, it might be about a 50% risk of lifetime depression in a person who has traumatic brain injury. And most of these patients are never offered treatment for depression. They never end up in the psychiatrist's clinic. They often end up in the neurologist's clinic and they're working on symptoms such as headaches and insomnia individually, but many of these things are related to their depression. Uh, now, it might be that they're never offered treatment because the treatments don't work very well, uh, and we're working on improving that. Or it might be because that they're never offered treatment because the underlying cause is not recognized. Now, TBI depression predicts poor outcomes beyond TBI alone or depression alone. And this is important because improvement in depression leads to improved cognitive and motor function. When we actually get these people better in terms of their depression, other aspects of their life get better too. And so it's really important to characterize this unique syndrome and better understand how to help this unique patient population. However, there's one important challenge. The important challenge is that everybody's brain with TBI is a little bit different. And uh, it's really hard to study a syndrome when everybody who has that syndrome is a little bit different from each other. And enter a new technology that we call individualized brain mapping, uh, or some people call this individualized precision functional mapping of the brain. This was developed at Washington University and a lot of other places. I was fortunate to be around at Washington University during residency when this technique was being developed. On the top is an example of a group mean network map of a person's brain. Uh, this is what, on average, what a few different brain networks look like. Uh, the blue is the dorsal attention network. The red is the default mode network. These networks have been involved in uh, traumatic brain injury. They've been implicated pretty extensively. And the yellow is a subgenual cingulate, which is a, a region that's been impl implicated pretty extensively in major depression. We wanted to look at the interaction between these things to see if it tells us something about depression and traumatic brain injury. On the bottom is an individualized brain network map. 
Uh, I'll spare you the math right now, but you're welcome to read the paper if you want to hear about how we have a machine learning algorithm that can recognize uh, how every little component of the brain might be part of a different network in an individual person. And when we do this, when we make these individualized maps, uh, we notice things that we wouldn't notice at the group level. For example, I'll draw your attention to this spot here in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, another region that's been heavily implicated in depression for, gen for decades. Uh, at the group level, we don't see anything there. But at the individual level, this person, this is a person with depression after traumatic brain injury, uh, he has a node in the dorsal attention network that's very obvious. It turns out that a lot of people have that spot uh, in the dorsal attention network somewhere in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, this classic depression region. Everybody seems to have it, or a lot of people have it, uh, but it's always in a different spot. So on average, it washes out and you don't see it anymore. This individualized mapping helps us detect it. Similarly, I'll bring your attention back to the subgenual cingulate, which on average is related to the default mode network, but not closely. But in some people, it's much more tightly connected than in others. At the individual level, we can detect really close overlap in some people. And that might have something to do with these depressive symptoms. At least that was our hypothesis. So here's what we did. We looked at a bunch of different people's uh, dorsal tension networks, subgenual cingulate, and default mode network, looked at the connectivity between those regions, and tried to see if that could tell us something about TBI-associated depression. And here's what we found. We classified people according to whether they had depression or not, and whether they had TBI or not. And we looked at the connectivity between this set of networks that I just told you about. And it turns out, in people who are not depressed, connectivity in this circuit is about the same, regardless of whether you have TBI or not. But if you are depressed, it, go, it becomes abnormal in opposite directions. In other words, it goes up in people with TBI-associated depression and it goes down in people dep with, in depression without TBI. This is a network that we previously implicated pretty extensively in depression without TBI. So it's interesting that the same network is affected in depression with TBI, just in a different way. Why does it go in the opposite direction? Perhaps it's some sort of compensatory response to the TBI. Perhaps it's some sort of long-term uh, uh, healing response. We don't necessarily know. That's something that's worth further studying. So when we first found this, we were really excited about it. We showed it at a bunch of conferences. Uh, and I showed it at the uh, International Neurotrauma Conference in Toronto in 2018. And afterwards, uh, a really uh, uh, valuable future collaborator, Rajendra Mori, came up to me and said, hey, I've, been, I've scanned about 180 patients in the Veterans Administration at, uh, at Duke. Uh, and, uh, and I think that would be a perfect way for you to test this hypothesis further. And I said, okay, well, let's try it. And so he, sh uh, he graciously shared his data with us, reprocessed uh, re it to fit with the processing that we had already done. Uh, and here's what we found. Uh, the exact same thing. People without depression uh, were the same in this circuit, regardless of whether they had TBI or not. The people with depression seemed to go in opposite directions. So we replicated this pretty clearly. We were also curious if this is specific to the networks we were looking at, the pair of networks, or th these pair of connectivity patterns, or if it's also true in other networks. So we compared it to a bunch of other networks, and it turns out that we found that the uh, dorsal attention to subgenual connectivity and the dorsal attention network to default mode network connectivity in both data sets were the peak predictor of de uh, depression after TBI, uh, whereas all these other pairs of networks were, were weaker predictors. So this confirmed our hypothesis. So let me summarize the few things that I just told you. TBI-associated depression appears to be a distinct physiological entity not just TBIs plus depression. And there is, we, we, we're not, now starting to call this a TBI affective syndrome. And this abnormal circuitry that we detected might be an effective treatment target. We're calling it TBI affective syndrome for a reason. Because I think when we call it TBI associated depression, that mischaracterizes what, is, what this disease really is. It makes it seem like it's an intersection or an incidental comorbidity between two things. And, uh, and in reality, it's not. What we think, what we're finding, is that this is a distinct physiological entity and a distinct clinical entity that warrants research to develop distinct treatments. So I shared some of these things at a, a, a traumatic brain injury conference in Washington, D.C. last week. And one of the most common questions that came up was, what's next? What are you guys going to do with this information? Well, there are a few things we're working on. One is to see if we can use individualized brain mapping to predict outcomes after TBI. The individualized brain mapping was actually a critical component of this study. Uh, if we, when we repeated the same analysis with group mean brain maps, it actually didn't work. We have to do the individualized mapping to make it work. And in fact, the individualized mapping significantly outperformed group mean maps. So can that actually predict outcomes in other ways after TBI? It turned, if, the, if this approach helps us predict depression, it might also help us predict other things.
Number two, we want to look at long-term follow-up with detailed imaging and phenotyping. We want to better understand, is this a compensatory response? Is this a causal response? What is the direction of, uh, of the response? And how does it relate to changes in symptoms over time? Can we get more detailed uh, characterization of people's behavior in this disease? Uh, third, we want to do a we're working on a clinical trial of therapeutic brain stimulation targeted towards the circuit. As you may know, therapeutic brain stimulation is a commonly used treatment for major depression, and we've shown in a pilot study that it actually works for depression after traumatic brain injury. It was a small pilot study, but, uh, but that was important because no other treatment has been shown to be effective for these people. So we're now doing a larger multi-center trial to try to uh, show if targeted brain stimulation, specifically a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, can help with these patients. Um, of course, I'm happy to take further questions. Here's my email address, uh, my lab website, and uh, Twitter has become my primary source of scientific communication these days. Uh, and last but not least, I'd love to thank all the important collaborators and co-authors that helped make this happen. For example, Sridhar Kandala, who is a programmer for the Human Connectome Project and a close friend of mine, who came over to my house after hours and taught me how to do all the programming, write code to do neuroimaging analyses, which I still use every day. Uh, Carl Hacker, who was an MD-PhD student at Washington University in St. Louis at the time when I was a resident there, but he's now a neurosurgery resident, and he uh, invented the individualized brain mapping algorithm that I described when he was a student and helped us implement it in, in practice. There's Heather Bouchard, who was a research assistant at Duke who helped process and organize the majority of the scans that we used in this study and reprocessed as I needed to, uh, uh, to correct various uh, subtleties. Um, Eric Luthar, who's a neurosurgeon at Washington University, who pioneered the idea of using this individualized brain mapping approach in clinical practice. Uh, Maurizia Corbetta, who was a professor at Washington University in neurology at the time, is now the chair of neurology at the University of Padua in Italy. Um, and he uh, inspired the idea that we can bring together all these heterogeneous data sets of people with TBI to try to answer unique questions. And he collected a lot of the data that we analyzed in the study himself. Uh, Raj Mori, who I met in Toronto when I was first presenting uh, this work, and uh, he came up with the idea that we can potentially replicate it in this large data set that he's collected himself, uh, and was ended up becoming a co-senior author thanks to the valuable uh, contribution that he made here. And finally, David Brody, who was a close mentor of mine, uh, helped me discuss that first patient who led to this uh, study being done. Uh, and helped us think through uh, a lot of these uh, sophisticated brain uh, abnormalities that we've been thinking about in patients with TBI-associated depression. Thank you for, for your time, and of course, I'd be happy to take any further questions. Thank you.